Hey there. So today's video, <laughs> it's going to be different. It's going to be long. If you want to grab a snack, <laughs> if you want to grab a beverage and you want to stay until the end, I invite you to do so. I was journaling this morning as I was reflecting on my life and these 49 years. Today is my birthday. And I thought about the lessons that I have learned in these last 10 years of my 40s from age 40 to age 49. And I want to share those lessons with you today. It is 1110, Monday, October 21st, 2024. And let's jump right in because this is going to be 40 lessons from my 40s. Lesson number one. You set your life up so you can reset it. I know that when we reach this age, this big age, <laughs> as one of my coaches likes to say, we can feel like our lives are set, you know, like our lives are set in stone. And excuse me, I'm going to put the fan on because at 49, I need some breeze. Um, when we set our lives up, we don't always own the decisions that we made in that time. And sometimes when regret sinks in and even resentment, you know, we can be tempted to blame other people for our position in life. But many of the circumstances that we find ourselves in our circumstances we decided our way into. And I had to own that in my life. And there were people who I felt angry with. There were people who I was blaming. And when I got honest with myself, I realized that I was blaming other people for choices that I made. And it was sobering but it was freeing at the same time because I realized that the, the same intellect, the same energy, the same spirituality, the same emotions that I put into making decisions that did not serve me, I can put into making decisions that will. And that was so empowering and was one of the reasons why I was able to move forward and to reset and reframe my life with what I like to call victorious vision. When we have guilt and shame and regret around the decisions that we made, we can develop this victim mentality where we always feel like we're under. We always feel like we're less than. We always feel like we're getting the short end of the stick. But when you have victorious vision, what happens is you own your choices. Not only do you own your choices, but you own your vision and you are not living in a way that you're trying to live up to what's expected of you but you're trying to live into your potential. And whether that is the potential that you see, because sometimes there's a potential that we see that's actually a ceiling, or you are really leaning into what God intended for you, which is way bigger than what you can see. Either way, you're looking at it from a point of view of there is more to life. You know, when you get that feeling of there has to be more to life than this, there is. And you get to a point where you actually believe that, you start to walk in it. So that's lesson number one. Lesson number two ties into that. 
one of the biggest flexes that I have as a 49 year old woman is forgiveness. In my 40s, I learned how to forgive. And I have said before that I have forgiven people, but I really didn't. I didn't know what forgiveness was. I didn't know the freedom in forgiveness. I did not understand the depth of forgiveness. And when I was truly able to forgive, not just other people, but myself, everything started to change. There is a peace. There is a, it's beyond peace. It is a wholeness and a healing that comes on the inside when you forgive, especially when you forgive yourself. Because when I was talking about making mistakes in the past, doing things the wrong way. It is so easy to blame other people. And it is so easy to beat up on yourself for the mistakes that you made. But many of us, the things that we might have done wrong in our 20s, in our 30s, it's not because we necessarily always knew better. Sometimes we didn't, we didn't know better or we didn't believe better. Because it's not always about what you know, but about what you believe. And coming to a point where you can release that woman who is trapped by the mistakes that she made. Release that woman who is trapped by her own shortcomings and by her own grief. Because a lot of the time you're grieving who you used to be. You're grieving the things that didn't work out. And that's okay. It's okay to grieve what you lose. The same way we grieve people who pass away, when opportunities slip through our fingers, when relationships or hold on on relationships that we once thought were so close and we held dear that slipped away from us, we're going to grieve. And that's all right. But when you allow yourself to grieve, take the time to look back and allow yourself to forgive. Allow yourself to forgive and to let go. Because you cannot walk into the future until you have forgiven your past. And that includes other people. And that includes yourself. Number three. Nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. I have seen things that I have worked on 10 years ago, 15 years ago, come to light. I have seen, and this is random, there are subjects that I did in school and I'm like, I don't even know why I'm doing this that I see serving me now, knowledge that I see serving me now. So nothing is wasted. My college degree, the first one and the second one, nothing is wasted. I I started as a fine arts major and I ended as a corporate communications major. Nothing is wasted. I'm using that in my life right now. I do all my graphics I do all my own logos. I do all my PDFs, everything, all the coursework, everything. I do it myself. And that stuff I didn't have to learn. That stuff that was already in me. That stuff that I already knew. So it wasn't wasted. I might have felt in my 10 years as a stay-at-home mom that it's like, okay, I have a college degree. Like, what am I doing with this? But it just wasn't time yet. It wasn't time yet for me to use certain skills. So nothing is wasted. Number four, you are just now getting to know yourself. My 40s, has truly been a time of awakening 
and a time of knowing, knowing me. And in my 20s and in my 30s, I had this sense of yearning to belong, this sense of yearning to be chosen. And I didn't realize it. I didn't see it for what it was. And it was because I had never fully acknowledged and chosen and seen myself. So this was a decade for me to learn me and to unlearn some of the things that I thought were true that actually weren't. And to relearn some things that I had let go of that I once knew that I once held as true about myself, that I had suddenly, hey, that I had let go of because of circumstances, because of life, because of life just life in. <laughs> and I lost track of me. So my 40s was a time to get to know me again. And that journey of self-discovery was not to be selfish. It was to present my authentic self. To present my authentic self to the people who I share life with, the people I do life with, and the people that I serve. Lesson number five. The most precious parts of you are hidden. In that effort to be seen, you can try to put yourself out there. And in putting yourself out there, there is a vulnerability to that, that everyone doesn't need to see and everyone doesn't need to know. There are parts of yourself that are only reserved for you and God. And if you aren't careful, you can expose those parts of yourself to the wrong people and end up being hurt because not everyone is able to handle those precious parts of you. And you have to be comfortable with treasuring those hidden parts of yourself because that's where your power lies. And you can't always place your power in the hands of people who don't understand how precious the hidden parts of you are. Number six, prioritize your self-care. Self-care is not selfish. And when I talk about self-care, I am talking beyond hair and makeup and manicures and pedicures. I am talking about the woman within, those things are important, right? Taking care of your body, exercise, diet, treating your temple well. The Bible says that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if God's spirit dwells within you, then you have to take care of the vessel that you are. But this also means taking care of your mind, it means taking care of your soul. It means taking care of your spirit. And if you've been here, especially recently, you'll hear me say a woman needs three daily appointments, one with God, one with herself, and then her appointments with other people. Self-care is essential. It's the foundation that you start your day with. It's, it's how you step into the world and you can't step into the world powerfully until you tap in to that power within, and that is God within you. Number seven, be responsible with your influence. Every woman has a sphere of influence. It could be your family. It could be your job. It could be your church. It could be social media. It could be the supermarket. It could be the mall. It could be the mall parking lot. 
everywhere you go, as long as you are interacting with another individual, you have influence. You are able to change situations. You are able to shift atmospheres by what comes out of your mouth. It is, I don't think we realize how our presence and our voices can shift things. If you are a mother, you know this. You have a crying baby. And when that child hears your voice or that child knows that you are close or you hold that child, the atmosphere around that child changes, right? That's because there is something unique about you. You can influence the emotions of that child. You can influence their mental state. You can make them feel comforted. The same applies to every single other place that you are in. You are influential. Don't ever feel that you nothing happens as a result of your your voice or your presence, something does happen, but it happens when you show up authentically and it happens when you show up powerfully and it happens when you show up confidently. So this is what you have to, to harness and to steward your, your authenticity and your confidence and your identity. It's your identity that gives you influence. It's your authority that gives you influence. And that comes from knowing who you are and knowing whose you are. Number eight, your body is beautiful at every stage. Now that I'm in what I call season 50, episode one, I realize that my body is changing. One of the things that I first saw change in is my neck. You know, they say like your neck ages. And I'm going to tell you, it bothered me for so long. And one day I looked in the mirror and I said, this is a 49 year old neck. This neck has been keeping my head up for 49 years. So if the skin starts to wrinkle or the skin starts to sag, it's okay. It doesn't change who I am as a woman. The skin on my stomach is wrinkly. It's not as tight as it used to be. I've given birth to three babies. (laughs) That's, That's a lot of stretching. I gained 40 pounds with each of my pregnancies. And... I've learned to honor the seasons that my body has gone through. I've gone through healing, physical healing, and I'm so grateful. So now when I look in the mirror, I I may see the flaws, but they don't bother me. And I don't see them as flaws. I see them as evidence of a life well-lived. I see them as evidence that my body has been through some things and has birthed some people. And I'm grateful. Number nine, healing is possible, no matter how many times you've been hurt. And I don't know if you know my testimony, but I'm just going to say it really briefly here. I had an issue of blood. Have you heard about the woman of the issue with the issue of blood in the Bible? She basically had her period for 12 years. And through faith, she pressed through the crowd just so she could touch the edge of Jesus's clothes so that she could be healed. So from 2011 to 2021, I had periods that would last anywhere from eight days to three weeks. And no doctor could tell me what was wrong. No one could diagnose anything. All my tests came back negative. No cancer. 
um, tiny little fibroids, but nothing to cause alarm. Blood work looks fine. Everything looks fine. Could not figure out what was wrong with me. And they were giving me medication to manage it. And no one could figure out what it was. And I was praying, but I wasn't praying with faith. I'm going to be honest. I was not praying with faith. And one day I had a friend who said I should go on a fast. And she, I can't even remember how many days she told me to fast for. And I'm going to be honest. I only fasted for like one day, but I fasted and prayed. I prayed all night. I prayed, I danced, I cried, I lay on the floor. Like I did all the things. And I was like in a point where I fully surrendered everything that was happening. I surrendered it to God. I said, God, I cannot do this. I cannot do this anymore. I want it gone because I had been praying for my cycle to return and just be normal. I just want to be normal. I just want to be like other women who have their period for like one week out of the month at best, right? And just go back to normal. And I reached the point where I started to say, I don't want this to ever come back. I am so done. I can't deal with this anymore. And I remember writing my book, my first book, Vision, and when I wrote my on my vision board in 2021, the very first thing that I wrote was complete healing. But when I said complete healing, the healing that I was looking to see was healing being a return of, you know, my normal cycle. That's not what happened. So my birthday is October 21st. This is my book, Vision. I launched this as an ebook on October 21st, 2021. And I know that writing and launching this book was part of my healing journey. Nobody could tell me otherwise. That was October 21st. And I think I was still bleeding at the time. My last day of bleeding might've been Yeah, it might have been that same day because on October 22nd, the bleeding stopped. And that was my last period. I had my last period, if I can call it a period, because it lasted, I think it lasted about two weeks. I had my last period on October 2021. I had just turned 46 That was three years ago. I haven't had a period since. My doctor can't explain what happened. She has no reason. So I went from bleeding month after month after month for weeks at a time to nothing. So when I tell you that healing is possible... And I'm talking about physical healing. When I tell you that healing is possible, I'm not saying it from a hopeful place. I'm seeing it from a place of seeing it in my own life. I'm saying it from a place of the God who can perform miracles doing it for me. But that was just the beginning. That was just the beginning of my healing. After that came spiritual healing, emotional healing, mental healing, because when you invite God into your healing journey, he's not going to do things halfway. And I'm trying not to, he's not going to do things halfway. He's going to meet you where you are and he's going to exceed what you need. So when I talk about healing, I'm talking about your holistic healing. I'm talking about your heart, that forgiveness that we talked about. I'm talking about mindset shifts, healing old mindsets that don't serve you anymore. 
healing old trauma that you've been carrying from one relationship to another, from one job to another, from one friendship to another. Full healing is possible no matter how long you've been hurting. Number 10, learn to enjoy your own company. I used to have a problem <laughs> with being alone. As much as I enjoy doing things by myself, I didn't enjoy feeling alone. And the reason I felt alone was because I was disconnected from myself. And I know that might sound crazy. Like, how are you disconnected from yourself? I was disconnected from my true self. I was trying to connect to a version of me that other people expected and that other people needed. But it wasn't the genuine version of me. And it wasn't until I was able to sit with myself and know myself. When I talked earlier about knowing yourself, knowing who you are, it wasn't until I began to know her and love her and cherish her and develop her that I felt that it was valuable to sit with her and enjoy what she had to say, what she had to offer and listen to her hopes and listen to your dreams. When I talk about a woman having an appointment with yourself, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those times when you sit with yourself, you sit with your dreams. When have you taken the time to sit with your dreams, to sit with your own desires and your own goals, as opposed to reacting to life responding to other people, being there for other people is important. It's an important part of being a woman. We are nurturers. We are encouragers. We are supporters. There's nothing wrong with that. But if everything you're doing is outside of yourself and it's coming from a place that is outside of yourself, then you are doing yourself and the people you love and the people you serve a disservice. Learn to love you. Learn to love your own company. Learn to appreciate you. When you do that, you appreciate the woman who God created you to be. And that's one of the things I talk about in the A-list assignment. Appreciate your attributes. Appreciating your attributes means understanding your makeup, who you are what you like, what you don't like, what you're good at, what you're not good at. But the word appreciate also means to increase in value. You're already valuable, but you're also an investment. And there's a seed that God planted in you that he expects a return on. He expects a return on his investment. So that now means that you appreciate yourself and appreciating yourself now means you're, you are going to invest in you. You are going to invest where God made the deposit. You now invest in that woman. That's education. That's health. That's your mentality. That's your spirituality. It's the whole woman. And you're not going to do that if you don't enjoy your own company because there are things that you're going to need to work on. There are aspects of your life that you're going to need to work on that you cannot do with anybody else. You're going to have to do this alone. And that's okay. Number 11. You are worth the wait. There are changes that you want to make in your life. There are relationships that you want to have. There's a job you want to work in. There are aspirations that you have. There are dreams and desires and goals. Those things are not going to happen overnight. And I want to encourage you not to get frustrated on the journey, not to give up before you're almost there because you couldn't wait anymore. 
Patience is a beautiful virtue that you will need for your personal vision. Whatever it is that you want, whether it is a certain state of health, a certain financial status, a certain type of relationship, a certain sense of spirituality, um, confidence and assurance, whether it's just peace, peace of mind, all these things are going to take time. I know that we live in a world where people are promising you all kinds of things. And I see it in the life coaching industry, especially they're like, meet with me for 90 minutes and I can change your whole life. And I could, I have had quick conversations with women who have so much deep wisdom in 30 seconds. I hear stuff from them that, that will shift something within me. Yes, that's possible. But now it's up to me to implement right? Because that's what wisdom is. Wisdom isn't knowledge. Wisdom isn't hearing something. Wisdom is hearing, processing, and then doing and understanding why you're doing and adjusting and tweaking. That's wisdom. And that does not come overnight. That comes over time. So understand that you are worth the wait. 100% worth the wait. And there will be people in your life who have their vision for you, right? They have their vision of how they want you to show up for them and their vision for you and their need for you and their desire for you can be legitimate and they could be pressing on you and they could be pushing on you for you to be a certain way. But in a lot of instances, they're going to have to wait because the woman that they need you to be may not be someone that you are yet. So does that mean now that you give up? Does that mean now that you walk away or that they walk away? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they do. And this is why We have to trust God in the process. This is why we have to trust our own process. And we have to trust that tug on our heart that is telling us that we need to step higher, that we need to move forward, that we need to have courage, that we need to have patience, that we need to have faith. Because there is a woman who God created you to be in his perfect will, and in his perfect timing. Can it happen instantly? Absolutely. But most of the time it doesn't. The Bible talks about letting patience have its perfect work. And I believe some translations also say her perfect work. It's funny how patience is um, represented as the feminine Patience is represented as the feminine. Wisdom is represented as the feminine. And I believe that these are qualities that we need as victorious visionaries of our own lives and being able to speak into other people's lives from a victorious place. It takes patience. Victories are often won over time. Wars are waged sometimes for years. And I'm not saying that it's going to take you 10 years like it did for me. It might take you six months. It might take you three weeks and it might take you 10 years, but you are worth the wait. Number 12, do not apologize for your evolution. You may pride yourself on your consistency. You may pride yourself on being the woman who you've always been. But the woman you have always been is not always going to serve you. And the woman you have always been is not going to serve the people attached to you. Because their seasons are going to change. Their needs are going to change. And if you are not evolving and changing in your own seasons 
of life, you are going to feel stuck. You are going to remain stuck in a particular place that you don't want to be in. And the grace and the ease that you used to have in one season, you will no longer have if you don't let yourself evolve. And you'll find that you have been in relationships, you've been at a job, you've been in certain situations for a long time, and all of a sudden, it feels difficult. And that's when you're not shifting. Or you start shifting because you feel something happening within you, and you feel like, And there are changes that I need to make in how I think. There are changes I need to make in my wardrobe. There are changes that I need to make. I need to go back to school. I need to stop um, eating a certain way. I need to start exercising. I need to do these different things. You start carrying yourself differently. And the people around you who would have seen you in a certain way at a certain level, they're like, you know, what's going on with you? You're changing or you've changed. And they don't take kindly to that because they're now confused. They're like, who is this woman? And you're confused yourself because you're like, I've never shown up like this. But at the same time, you feel this this inner leading to, to evolve, to become someone new, to become someone different, to deepen your spirituality, to, to start educating yourself to you're looking at self-help self-help books you're listening to podcasts you're doing all these different things and people are like you're acting funny you're acting weird you're being off like I don't know what's wrong with you <laughs> you know you're not fun anymore it used to be fun to hang around you're not fun anymore and I believe that sometimes when you're in that state you want to isolate and you want to you want to go into a cocoon that's how I, how I refer to it. And that's fine. That's fine. Because when you think about the transition, the metamorphosis from a caterpillar to a butterfly, there is a point where you don't see the caterpillar. When the caterpillar is changing into a butterfly, you neither see the caterpillar nor the butterfly. Because there's a time of isolation that needs to happen. And when that isolation happens, that's when the evolution happens. Some of you are already going through this. Some of you have already done this. And you come out looking different. People are used to seeing you crawling. People are used to seeing you, a fat little grubby caterpillar crawling on the ground. And then all of a sudden you're flying around. And then people are looking at you and they're like, who do you think you are with these wings flying around? I knew you when you were a caterpillar. So now you're feeling like, maybe I should be a caterpillar again, but you can't. And now you want to apologize for who you've become. Do not apologize for your evolution. Do not apologize for your transformation. Do not apologize for your healing. Do not apologize for your breakthrough. Do not apologize for your wisdom. Do not apologize for becoming. Do not apologize for your journey. Do not apologize for your goals. Do not apologize for your dreams. Do not apologize for your faith. Do not apologize for your evolution. Number 13, your body does not have to fall apart in your 40s or your 50s, or your 60s, or your 20s, especially those of us moms, there is this expectation that, oh, because you've had children, now you're supposed to just let yourself go. It's par for the course. And that is so far from the truth. Now, I will tell you, I have some good genes. I'm, I'm, working, I'm working with a good foundation. But if I'm not careful about what I eat, if I'm not careful about getting my steps in every single day, because I'll be honest, I do not work out the way that I want to. And that's changing starting today. That is changing because as I step into my 50s and I'm looking at beyond, I want to make triple digits. 
I want to make triple digits. That is a part of my personal vision. I want to be a hundred plus in these streets. Okay. And doing that means that I have to steward my body. It means that I have to look at what I'm putting into my body and how I'm treating my body and how I, uh, I allow my body to be treated. So letting myself fall apart is not an option. Number 14, this goes back to what I was talking about with evolution. We can often get stuck because we feel like we need to be consistent and being consistent means showing up the same way that we showed up 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Life is changing. The world is changing. The, the relationships that we are in are changing. The jobs that we are in are changing. Technology is changing. So much is changing around us. And it can be difficult to feel like you are being yourself in a changing world because you feel like everywhere you go, you have to adapt. You know, like you need to be this way over here and you need to be this way over here and you need to be another way over here. And it's like, who am I? This goes back to having those daily appointments. You have to to lock in and you have to know who you are and you have to be able to adapt. Your authenticity includes change. Your authenticity includes your ability to adapt. If you choose not to change, you are not being authentic. An authentic woman is going to be flexible. She is going to be teachable. She's going to be moldable, not by external forces, but by wisdom. Wisdom is going to guide you on how to adapt. Wisdom is going to guide you on how to change. And wisdom is going to show you the inevitable changes that you cannot avoid. No matter how hard you try to push back, there are things that are going to change within you. Some of you are stuck because God has been trying to tell you, not trying to, God has been telling you, you have been trying not to listen to what God is telling you through your life, through the people that you interact with, through what's happening in your body, through the nudges that you've been getting over the years that you've been avoiding that it's time to change, that it's time to shift, that it's time to move on, that it's time to dig deeper. Listen to those things and understand that authenticity includes your ability to adapt. Number 15, don't be afraid to look back. When life happens, we can be very tempted to move on. We can be very tempted to just want to, we want to move forward. What are off a duck's back? Oh, it doesn't bother me. Oh, it doesn't hurt me. Don't let them see you sweat. Don't let them see you cry. Just move on, girl. Just move on. Suck it up. Pick yourself up and move on. I hear that. I hear that. And there's a level of truth to that. But do not be afraid to look back because if you don't, if you don't examine what happened, if you don't examine where you have come from and what caused you to be there in the first place, in your efforts to move forward, you can find yourself recreating the same situation that you walked away from. So you leave a job or you leave a relationship or you leave a friend group only to find yourself exactly in the same situation that you left. 
six months ago or six years ago. And you're like, why does this keep happening to me? It's because you didn't look back. When you look back, you learn. So it's not just looking back for the sake of regret and being like, oh man, why did I do that? You beat yourself up. You're like, I feel so bad about what happened. Um, And then you're in this broken place where you develop this resolve and it's like, I will never let that happen to me again. But if you don't learn the lesson, it's going to happen again. When I talk about becoming a, a victorious visionary of your own life, that's where the wisdom comes in. And wisdom is not going to come in an area that you are not willing to address. And sometimes addressing the things that need to be addressed require you to look back. Not for long, not to wallow in it, not to feel pitiful, not to feel angry, not to feel resentful, not to get bitter, but to learn, to learn the lesson of that part of your life. And not only to learn, but to heal Because a healed woman is a whole woman. A healed woman is going to walk forward into the new chapter of her life, armed with wisdom, with knowledge, and with faith. Because there's no point in walking forward if you're not walking forward in a belief that it's going to be better. Because if you don't believe it's going to be better, then you might as well just stay where you are. So if you have decided to walk away, and if you have already walked away, don't be afraid to look back because you don't want to repeat what you walked away from. Number 16, know the difference between cycles and seasons. A cycle is going to repeat itself. It's going to repeat itself over and over and over again. I'm talking about the cycles that keep you stuck. So you're either going to have cycles where you're repeating and you're in the same place year after year. We're coming up on the end of 2024. And this time last year, you were dealing with this same issue. That's because you're in a cycle. What happens with seasons is that there is, even though there's change, there's a synergy and there's a harmony and there's a purpose and there's a flow. And that's what you want for your life. You want to be able to move from one season to another as seamlessly. Think about the seasons of the weather as seamlessly as winter flows into spring and it flows into summer and it flows into autumn and it flows into winter again and it's dependable and it's sure and it's purposeful because within each season there's specific things that are going to happen and they're happening for a reason that's how you want to live your life understanding the seasons of your womanhood And understanding who you need to be in each season. When you think about natural seasons, there's a certain way that you dress in a certain season. If you're not dressed for that season, you're going to be uncomfortable. If you're dressed like I am and it's winter, you're going to be freezing. It's kind of hot in here. But if you're dressed like I am in the winter, it's not going to work. How do you need to dress yourself? How do you need to, there's certain things that you eat in the winter that you don't want to eat in the summer, right? Summer, you want to eat something light. You want to eat something that's going to cool your body. Winter, you want to eat something a little heavier. You want some soup. You want some stews. You want something hearty. You want something warm. So it's about, it's about how you dress yourself. It's about how you nurture yourself. Your seasons of life are no different. And if you think about the decades of your life, what you needed in your 20s, what you desired in your 20s is not necessarily what you desire in your 40s. I know it's different for me. And now that I'm walking into my 50s, it's vastly different. 
the things that I find entertaining and enjoyable have changed because I'm in a different season of life. And recognizing the patterns, this is going back to what I said about those three daily appointments. When you have that appointment with yourself and you have that appointment with God, you're going to be able to recognize the patterns because you're constantly in touch with yourself. You know what happens when you recognize patterns? You start to break cycles. Those repeated negative cycles. You start to recognize patterns and you start to pinpoint things and you say, oh, wait a minute. This time last year, this is what happened. Oh, wait, every time I get to a certain point in my relationship or every time I get to a certain point in my job, every time I'm up for promotion, this happens. And then you start to realize what's really going on in your life and you start to pinpoint those things. And there's a scripture that I love. I believe it's in Proverbs. I'm so bad with address. <laughs> finding the address of the scripture, but I believe it's in Proverbs where it says, when the thief has been caught, he has to repay seven times what he stole. And I believe that the shifts that we, that we experience in life, the breakthroughs that we experience in life is when we catch the thief. And when we catch the thief is when we recognize those patterns and we recognize the things that either we have done wrong or have been done wrong to us. We recognize where the enemy and we have a very real enemy women. We have a very real enemy spiritually who is trying to keep us stuck in cycles in our mentality He's trying to keep us stuck in cycles spiritually. There are things that you haven't even done, but you have been born into generational things. And we talk about generational curses and generational cycles, but there are generational habits. There are generational mindsets. And until you break those habits, those mindsets, do you find that they're common experiences that women in your family have had? That when they reach a certain age, certain certain things happen. Or they all have certain types of relationships. Those are cycles. So when you recognize the patterns, you can break the cycle. And could it be that you're the one in your family? Could it be that you're the one in your generation who is going to break that cycle? Not just for yourself, but to show another woman that it can be done. To show another woman that we don't have to live the way our mothers and our grandmothers and our aunts and our sisters have lived. That we can be different. To show our daughters that things can be different from here on out. So know the difference between the cycles and the seasons. Lesson number 17, don't settle, don't settle, don't settle. I know that we want to be real, right? We want to face reality, but I dare you, I dare you to listen to your own dream. I dare you to listen to the dream in your heart that says there has to be more to life than this. There has to be a better experience than what I am going through right now. Because there is a part of you, and I heard a rabbi say this, that women, women were not born, women were not, sorry, women were not created from nothing as man was created. Man was created from the dust, but woman was created from man. So she has a sense of humanity she has a sense of of who she is. No matter what a woman has gone through, no matter how low she has made herself to feel or been made to feel, there is a part of her that believes there has to be something better for me. And I love that. I think that's so beautiful. 
And I believe that many of you feel that. And that's why you, you desire what you desire. That's why you desire the intimacy that you desire. That's why you desire the romance that you desire. That's why you desire the success that you desire because you believe that you are worth it. Even if you only believe it this much, you believe that you are worth it. And I dare you to dig in and I dare you to hone in on that desire because guess what? There are things that God wants for you. There are things that God has created for you to create. And when he does this, he does this with his best in mind, his absolute best. So don't settle. Don't settle for less than that. I dare you to elevate your dreams I dare you to elevate your goals and I dare you to expect better from life. Do not settle. Don't settle for where you are and don't settle for who you are because there is more to you. Even though you may be accomplished, you may not be a woman who you think has low self-esteem or isn't sure of herself. You may be very confident. But even if you have reached the top of your game, so to speak, there's always more. Does this mean that we become greedy and we become, you know, so power hungry that we're never satisfied? No. There is contentment and there is space for contentment and there is space for peace, but there's also space for more. There is also space for more. So don't settle. Number 18, say you're sorry. Say you are sorry. There are people that I have had to apologize to. And the hard thing sometimes about apology is admitting that you made a mistake. And an apology is not just saying I'm sorry, an apology is also changed behavior. And sometimes a reason why we're incapable of apologizing or uncomfortable with apologizing is that it means that if I say I'm sorry, I'm now expected to change my behavior. And sometimes we don't know how to do that, <laughs> right? Sometimes it's like, I feel bad but I don't know how to fix this. So we say nothing, but apologies are needed. Understanding where you went wrong, understanding why you went wrong and understanding what you need to do next as all part of an apology. But it starts with saying, I'm sorry and learn to apologize to yourself. We always talk about apologizing to other people and other people apologizing to us. But sit with yourself and tell yourself, sorry for those times when you didn't show up or you didn't speak up or you accepted less than you know that you're worth. Tell yourself that you are sorry and mean it. Love yourself enough to apologize to yourself the same way you would apologize to a friend or a loved one. That creates space for your own healing. And it also builds compassion because when you have compassion with yourself, when you can apologize to yourself, it'll be easier for you to apologize to other people. Number 19. We hear about soft life, right? This is a trend. Um, you know, you want to live that soft life. You want to have peace. You want to have candles everywhere. You want to have mood music, <laughs> right? But you got to deal with your heart because a hard heart cannot live a soft life. A woman who is battered within, a woman who is bitter a woman who is angry, a woman who is resentful, cannot light enough candles, 
cannot have enough creams, cannot do enough manicures and pedicures and massages to soften her heart. And a soft heart is so much more powerful than a loud mouth. Sometimes we want to state our independence and we want to state our freedom and we want to set our boundaries and all that. You have to start within. You have to start with a soft heart because when your heart is hard, it's hard to dream and it's hard to hope and it's hard to believe. And the goals that you set you're going to set from a bitter place. You're going to set from an angry place. You're going to set from a place of getting back at people or showing them, you know, all those people who didn't believe me, I'm going to show them that I can do it. I get that. I get that. But we don't want to set rules. We don't want to set, sorry. We don't want to set goals that are bla- that are based in hurt and shame and resentment and anger. So working on your heart is essential to having victorious vision. Number 20, get out of your comfort zone. Do something different. Do something that makes you uncomfortable. Do something new. And I just looked up and I didn't think about this example before, but I'm looking at this lanyard and a few years ago, two years ago, right? This was 2022. I decided to go to this event. It was a leadership event and there were going to be like, oh, managers and CEOs and all these high profile people there. Most of the people went with their companies. And I remember saying, I am going to make the investment. And I took that day and I asked my husband to pick the children up. I think he dropped them off and picked them up. I'm trying to remember because I usually do that. And I took that day for myself and it was in October. So that was like an early birthday present to myself. And I keep glancing at the lanyard because I have it up on my vision board as a reminder to invest in myself. And I remember dressing up and I walked into that room and I had recently gotten my coaching certification. My book was like a year old, like not even a year old at the point because it was like early October. And in the back of my mind, it was like, what are you doing? Like, where do you think you're going? But it was one of the most amazing events. I was so uncomfortable at first. And I remember being seated at this table and there was a woman who was next to me. And we were, I think, the only two people who were VIP at that table. The other people, they were with a company. So other people were like, oh, um, you know, what company are you with? And I said, um, you know, I'm here alone. Um, I came by myself. And then the other lady who was sitting next to me, she's like, me too. And I said, yeah, it's my birthday. My birthday's coming up. And this is an early birthday present to, to myself. And she's like, me too. And so we hit it off. And that actually forged a connection. And that was one of my very first speaking engagements that came out of that. And she's like, you know, I'm, I'm following some of the stuff that you're saying. And just based on this conversation, I, I really think that we have a great connection here. I'm mentoring a group of women. Can you come speak to them about what you do? And, you know, teach them how they can create a vision for their lives. And I was like, flabbergasted and I remember going to her event and it was like a graduation of sorts because she had been working with them for quite a while and they were talking about their experience and now coming out of that I shared the vision sequence with them and I spoke for I think over two hours and the funny thing was 
I had notes prepared. I had an entire speech prepared and I came early and I walked into the room and I got mic'd up and everything. And so I was sitting there watching her finish. And as I'm sitting there and I'm listening to what she's saying, I knew within me that what I had prepared was not what I needed to share that day and that I needed to shift my entire message. And so I didn't even use my whiteboard. I bought a whiteboard with me. I had the whole setup. I had my laptop. I had everything ready to go. And I spoke from the heart. I shared from the heart without notes for, yeah, that was my first speaking engagement actually. And I was so out of my comfort zone, but at the same time, so comfortable because I was being authentic. And I shared all that to say that sometimes what's holding us back from being authentic is the comfort zone. You might think that the real you is within your comfort zone, but you have no idea who the real you is. You have no idea what she is capable of. And the second you step outside your comfort zone, possibilities for those dreams that you have shifted to the back burner and those things that you have not invested in developing within yourself, those possibilities are going to open up for you. And they may not be speaking engagement. It may be a job. It may be a relationship. It may be a new level of fitness, it may be restoration, it may be wholeness, it may be healing. For many of you, it's so many different things. But what you want, what you truly desire, what is going to fulfill your life is outside of your comfort zone. And the impact that you were created to make is outside of your comfort zone. So step out. Number 21, document your life. And this is something I am so passionate about. I am actually reading from my journal because I finished this list earlier this morning. I spent a few hours just sitting with myself. This year, I didn't want to celebrate in the traditional sense. This year, I really wanted to reflect And I really wanted to share lessons, wisdom, guidance, insight to other women who are finding it hard to navigate this season. And all of what I'm sharing with you is coming out of me documenting me writing my life and rewriting my life and rewiring my mind and rewiring my heart so that I could show up like this, so that I could share, so that I could teach and hopefully inspire you. So document your life. And I learned this from Rachel Luna because I did have this fear that someone would find my journal and read my deepest, darkest thoughts and my deepest, darkest desires. And I felt sometimes ashamed of my own dreams and my own desires. And I had to get over that. I felt ashamed sometimes of my own pain, the things that I was writing, prayers that I was writing. Um, challenges that I was going through. But I realized that when I journal, revelation comes. When I journal, healing comes. This book was birthed out of me journaling for years. It's a guided sequence where you can journal. Because there is so much healing. There is, there is nothing like it. You can read a book. You can read a book and you can gain wisdom. 
But when you journal, you are writing your own story. And there is something about what happens, especially when you learn to do it in a way that unlocks things within you. It unlocks what has been held up. Ideas, emotions, revelation. It unlocks so much. And sometimes it just starts with pouring out because that's how it started for me. It just starts with saying, today is dot, 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 and I feel. And you go from there. But I want to encourage you as you journal, don't let it end with today was a horrible day and this is how I feel. And you release all those emotions and then you close the journal and you walk away because I did that for years and that wasn't serving me. You have to journal in a way that you're looking for understanding and you're asking yourself questions. Don't be afraid to ask yourself questions as you journal. So you're saying, I feel this and you're saying this happened. So it's like this happened. This is how I feel. And then a great question to ask is, what is this teaching me? And out of that, a great prayer to pray is, God, what are you teaching me? And when you open yourself up to that, everything changes. Everything changes. Everything within you changes and everything around you changes because you're shifting your mindset from a victim mentality to a visionary mentality. And all of this is happening in your journal. Number 22, we still have a lot to go. If you are with me, comment below and tell me that you are with me. Just comment, I'm with you. Know your wants, this is number 22, know your wants versus your needs. When you sit with yourself and you understand your seasons, you're going to understand what you need to navigate this season. There are things that you want, there are desires that you have, there are legitimate desires, but they may not be necessary right now. There are, and sometimes those are things, specifically like things, like, I don't know, a designer bag, uh, (laughs) um, manicures and pedicures, massages. That might not necessarily be something you need right now. It could be something you want. It could be something desirable and it's helpful, but is it really something that you need for this season? And often our needs are the things that are deeper than our wants. And I can't tell you what that is. Only you can tell you what that is. But until you understand the season you're in, You're not going to know what you need for the season that you're in. Do not prioritize your wants over your needs. And sometimes these wants are the things that make us look good to other people. So there are the things that... It could be, and this is this is the weird balance because it could be, let's say you're working out and you want your body to look a certain way. And it goes back to what I was saying about the heart and taking care of your heart, taking care of your mind, taking care of your spirit. You might want to dress a certain way. You might want to look a certain way. And while there's nothing wrong with that, is that feeding the need of the woman within? Is the woman within starving the spirit within you your soul is she starving while you take care of your skin while you work out while you show up for all the things and you do all the things are you taking care of your actual needs do you know your actual needs 
And this applies to every part of your life. This applies to your family life. It applies to your relationships. It applies to your job. How do you do your job well if you don't know what you need to do your job well? How do you um, love people the way that they need to be loved? If you don't know what you need and who you need to be in order to love them that way, how do you accept love? Right? What do you need in order to accept love? Because there are some women who don't understand that they need to heal. And they're in great relationships and they have great friends. They have a wonderful job. Everything looks good on paper and yet they're still not happy because they're not attending to their own needs. I call it attending to the woman within, like knowing the woman within and what she needs. It's so important. Lesson number 23, deepen your relationships. I am, I'm very much a loner because I am a creative person. I write a lot. I write every single day, every single day. I am currently 11,000 words in to a big writing project that I'm hoping to finish by the end of this year. And I need to be alone in order to do that. And I get lost. <laughs> I get lost in it to the point where I don't even desire to have anyone around me. I don't even desire to speak to people. And as a wife, as a mom, that can be very isolating to my family. And I, I found this out the hard way because it's very easy for me to pull away it's very easy for me to get lost in what I'm doing. I don't know if you could see. There's an easel behind me. I haven't been doing that much art, but I've been getting back into it. And I can get lost. <laughs> I can get lost in drawing. I can get lost in sewing. My sewing machine is back there as well. I'm a very creative person. And... I feel fulfilled in that. And I know that you, I don't know what your thing is and you might get all into your thing. And especially if you are a woman who you have put yourself on the back burner for so long, you started doing your thing and you are all in doing your thing. And you might be leaving people behind who love you. You might be leaving people behind who need you, who need your support who need your guidance, who just need your love, who need your presence. And those relationships, as you deepen your relationship with yourself, as you deepen your relationship with God, as you learn to love yourself, as you learn to appreciate yourself in the two ways that we spoke about earlier, those relationships have to be deepened as well. So making time for people, when I talk about the three relationships every woman needs to have, note that your relationship with others is on there. So others is everybody outside of yourself. So that means that just as intentional as you're going to be to have your time with God, your time with yourself, and that includes things like this, it includes hobbies, it includes journaling, it includes exercise, it includes all those things. And then your relationships with your appointment, sorry, with others, you're going to make an appointment, make an appointment with your husband, your boyfriend, make an appointment with family, make an appointment with friends to catch up, to have lunch, to do those things. Those things are important. We were meant for connection. So when I talk about working on yourself, when I talk about doing all these things for yourself, it's not just for the purpose of staying within yourself and staying to yourself. It's for the purpose of deepening those relationships. It's for the purpose of showing up well in the lives of others, the, the lives of the people you love and the lives of the people that you serve. 
Number 24, know your unique purpose. Every single woman has a unique purpose, a very specific purpose that she was created for. And you will know this because you could take five women and you tell them to do the same thing. Let's say, let's say it's a recipe. You give five women a recipe, they each follow a recipe, and then you end up with five different flavors, even though they all follow the same thing, because every single woman has her unique weight and her unique twist to doing things. And every single woman is in a different environment. I didn't know this, but years ago, I learned that in baking, if you are in a a drier climate or a more humid climate, that's going to affect how the recipe turns out. So if I'm in Arizona and I'm baking, but someone else is in Florida and they're baking and they're following the same recipe, it could come out two different ways. So it's not just the woman that will affect the recipe, but the environment is going to affect the recipe. Now, the recipe, let's look at it as the recipe being purpose. You might think part of your purpose, and you might know, because part of your purpose is the relationships that you have with other people. So part of your purpose could be in the different roles that you have, your role as a wife, your role as a mother, your role as an employee, right? And each of these roles come with a recipe. It comes with a way that you show up. It comes with your your job description, so to speak, right? And you are required to follow this recipe. Every woman isn't going to follow the recipe the same way because every woman comes prepackaged with her own flavor, her own way. There is a, a way for you to do things. And there are specific things, specific ideas that are going to be birthed through you. Specifically, like, I don't think enough women understand this. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have this big business empire and you're going to do, you know, all these things and it's going to be on the news and you're going to get interviewed by all these. I'm not talking about that. There are things that are important that maybe only one person is going to see. I will never forget one of my coaches, Patrice Washington, She was a pivotal part of my 40s, actually. Um, She was my coach in 2021. And she talked about Miss Boynton, who was her teacher when she was a child, who told her that if she knew something, she had the responsibility to teach and to make sure that other people knew it too. And she shared that in her 40s. So as a 40-something, she's still remembering what this teacher told her all those years ago. Could it be that Ms. Boynton's purpose was to point out to Patrice that she needed to teach others. And I believe that statement that rang true for her through all those years is part of the reason why she became a coach is one of the things that formed her into the person that she is today. So your purpose may not be to be in the limelight. Your purpose may not be to be on platforms all over the world. Your purpose could be to speak life into your children, right? To show up as a guiding light in your your workplace. Your purpose could be something that only you and one other person will see. But understand this, and this is another beautiful thing that I realized about women. A woman who carries a daughter is carrying her grandchildren. Why am I saying this? 
because there are women whose lives you will touch by the words that you speak and the life that you live. And if you are not aligned with the woman who God created you to be and the purpose that God has placed inside of you, they will never hear the words that they need to hear in order to fulfill their purpose. So just as physically we carry generations, we carry generations verbally, we carry generations by our essence, by our energy, by how we show up. We carry generations spiritually as women. So there is purpose in your breath. There is purpose in your existence and knowing your unique purpose, knowing your unique flavor, knowing how you add pizzazz to the recipe of life is going to enhance the lives of others in ways that you cannot comprehend, but are so important. Number 25, breakthrough is a process. Breakthrough is not a moment. You will have aha moments, but breakthrough is often a series of things that led to that aha moment because you're not going to have that aha moment just like that. There are these little hints that have been placed in your air. They have been placed in your spirit over time. So by the time that aha moment comes and it clicks, it's clicking because the seed has already been planted. And there's a beautiful scripture that talks about how one plant, one waters, but God gives the increase. And that aha moment is like the increase. It's like when the, when the field comes to full fruit and full bloom, and you're like, oh, this is what I needed. This is what I need to do. This is how I'm going to lose the weight. This is how I'm going to get the budget together. This is how I'm going to save my marriage. This is how I can get through to my children. This is it. But it happens over time. So this goes back to patience. Be patient with the process of your life. Number 26, I have learned that harmony is greater than balance. We could talk about work-life balance. We can talk about all the things that we're trying to juggle as women. And for so many of us, it's like you have two hands, right? So it's like, what do I put in this hand? And what do I put in this hand? And the way I like to describe it is instead of trying to balance life like this, you want to create harmony like this right? When you create harmony, what happens is everything interlocks, right? And everything feeds off each other and everything ebbs and flows. So even though one thing may be prominent in your life in one season, it doesn't mean that everything else goes away, but there is, there is a flow and what is needed in the moment is allowed to come to the forefront while other things go to the back. Not that they're being neglected, but it's a matter of prioritizing. It's a matter of prioritizing your life. And there is actually a sheet. I'm going to link it in the description. It's what I call the visionary life sheet. And it allows you to look at 12 areas of your life and what you do what you do is you're able to see your life from a bird's eye view. Because what can happen is we often see our lives in light of what's going really well or what's going really wrong. And then we forget about everything else. But you are a multifaceted woman. There are so many different things. You're wearing so many different hats all at the same time. And instead of juggling it, because when you juggle, all the balls are in the air, Right. And if you move your hands away, everything falls. But when you have harmony, when you have harmony and everything is knit and everything is intertwined and you understand how your, your marriage 
and your finances and your health and your spiritual life is all connected and you are dealing with the whole woman, you're dealing with all of you, then you're able to have a better hold on your life as opposed to juggling, as opposed to trying to balance. Because here you are, you're trying to balance. And here's the thing. If you're trying to balance things in your hands, what happens when you fall? What happens when you trip and you fall? You, you can't use those hands to brace yourself. You can't use those hands to brace your own fall because you're carrying things, right? Whereas if everything is knit and everything is intertwined, it's almost like you're creating a, a field around you. You're creating a buffer around you that braces your fall. And you're setting up your life in such a way. And if you do it really well, and that's what I'm aiming for, you might trip a little bit. You might stumble a little bit, but you're not going to fall. You're not going to fall. So creating that harmony is like creating a net around yourself, creating a bubble even around yourself that protects you, that keeps you. 27, and this is real quick, real simple, raise your expectations. Raise your expectations. We talk about faith. We talk about having faith. Faith is not delusional, right? Faith is not, faith is not the Lulu. <laughs> I hear people talking about being the Lulu. No, it is not the Lulu. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? That's Bible. And you're like, well, if I've never seen it, what is the evidence? And can I share this? This is going to sound to some of you like poetic it's gonna sound woo woo but the revelation that I received is that your faith is the residue of what already is everything is spiritual everything is spiritual like this pen this pen is spiritual how somebody conceived this before it actually was, before it actually was a thing that I could click, that I could write with, someone conceived this in their mind, in that spiritual space. Then they maybe drew it out. Then they did a prototype. Then they tested it. Then they manufactured it. And then they sold it. Everything in your life is the same way. Everything in your life is the same way. And it is often through faith in the negative that we create what we don't want. So imagine if you take that same energy and raise your expectations. You know, people talk about raising your vibration. I don't know about that, but raise your expectation for what can happen in your life. Raise your expectation for having breakthrough. Raise your expectation for restored relationships. Raise your expectation for your health. Raise your expectation for your finances. Raise your expectation for that child who won't listen, who never listened, who gives you the most trouble. Raise your expectations and see what happens. Start believing, start hoping Start having faith. And there's, I'm going to go back to scripture again. There was a man in the Bible who he wanted to believe. He wanted to believe so bad. And he said, Lord, help my unbelief. So if you find that you don't have the faith that you think that you need to have, and you're like, I hear what you're saying. And I would love to be as positive as you are. And I would love to feel the way that you feel. And I would love to raise my expectations. Pray about it. Pray about it and ask God, I want to believe. I don't want to be resentful anymore. I don't want to feel so apathetic. I don't want to feel so eh about life. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Well, that's good for you, but that can't happen for me. Raise your expectations. I don't want to feel that way anymore. Lord, help me. Help my unbelief. I had to do that. 
to get to the point where I shared about my healing journey journey earlier, to get to the point where I could say, I could pray about this. I could pray in faith and I could believe that God was going to heal me to get to that point. I had to pray, Lord, help my unbelief because I was at a point where I was believing for other people's miracles. And I was praying for other people's miracles, but I couldn't do it for myself. So raise your expectations. Number 28, be willing to invest in yourself, whether that is time, whether that is money, whether that is effort, be willing to invest in yourself. Remember what I said, God is expecting a return on his investment. There is a seed that has been planted in you, the seed of potential, the seed of his vision for your life. Be willing to invest in yourself. Be willing to be watered. Be willing to be nurtured. Be willing to place yourself in an environment where you can grow, where you can learn, where you can thrive so that you can be what you were created to be. You got to be willing to make that investment. You got to put your money where your mouth is. You got to put your time where your mouth is. You got to put your effort where your mouth is. Be willing to invest. Number 29, know your limits. Know your limits and know when it's time to push forward and when it's time to pull back. There is a, a balance between pushing through the challenge and overworking to prove yourself and overworking to prove that you can do it because whatever it is for you, because you've had so much disappointment in the past, you just have to push through to get this done. And you can reach a point where that's not healthy. So you have to be in touch with yourself and you have to know yourself and you you have to understand how long is this sacrifice going to last? One of the things that we deal with in the vision sequence is sacrifice. And a lot of women, they are all too familiar with sacrifice to the point where sacrifice becomes a, a way of life. But sacrifice is seasonal, right? Sacrifice is seasonal, it is strategic, and it is specific, Sacrifice is temporary. It is not meant to be a weight of life. You should not always be getting the short end of the stick in your life. So understanding your season is going to tell you when it's time to sacrifice, when it's time to push through, make the sacrifice, burn the midnight oil, do whatever you need to do, and when it's time to pull back when it's time to rest, because both are necessary. So know your limits and honor your limits. Honor the limits of your body. Honor the limits of your mind. Honor the limits of your heart. And this is about setting boundaries, not just setting boundaries with other people, but setting boundaries with yourself. Are you setting boundaries with yourself and holding yourself to those boundaries. Because guess what? When you set your own boundaries and you honor boundaries within yourself, you will be able to set boundaries with other people. The reason why it is so hard for some of us to set boundaries with people is that we don't have our own and we don't hold ourselves to our own standards. So know your limits set those limits, honor your own limits before you can enforce boundaries on others. Number 30. All right. We're coming into the home stretch. If you're still with me, comment vision. Number 30, whatever this is for you, do not do it without God. I am a Christian. I cannot talk to you about vision and not talk to you about God. Because the truth is, whatever vision is on your heart that feels like it's too big for you, 
it's highly likely that it's a vision from God. It's highly likely that it's, it's an idea that he has thought toward you. And I love how scripture says, where God says to Jeremiah, I know the thoughts I think toward you. Like not about you, but toward you. So it's like he's downloading ideas and downloading thoughts into your mind. And that's sometimes why you look at the vision that you may have for your life that you may not have documented because it seems so far-fetched. You're like, how would I possibly be able to do this in my own strength? You can't. You can't. And your big vision may not be owning a a billion dollar company. Your big vision may not be something that has global impact. Your big vision can be to be the first woman in your family who's not overweight. Your big vision could be um, being a college graduate. Your big vision could be owning a home. Your big vision can be having peace in your heart. Your big vision could be forgiving people who who hurt you in the past and being able to move on with your life and living in that freedom. That could be your big vision. But whatever it is, do not do it without God. Because you want a blessed life. You want a victorious life. And it is only through him that we have victory. It is only through him that we have true blessing. It is only through being in alignment with his thoughts and his plans and his vision for our life that we have true fulfillment and that we have true purpose. So don't do it without God. Number 31, if you want something for yourself, give it to yourself first. There's a certain way that you want to be treated right? There's a certain way that you want to treat people. You want to come across as kind, as loving, as generous, as supportive. Do not people please for the sake of being accepted by people. Because you will always find yourself overextending, overworking, overproving, overdoing, in order to feel significant and in order to feel accepted. Appreciating yourself, acknowledging yourself, understanding who you are is going to put you in a position to create within yourself what you need, to create within yourself what you want to be for other people. Because if you don't, then you're not being authentic. And when I tell you authenticity is the secret sauce in in loving people, in serving people, it has to come from a place, it has to come from a place of authenticity because there is a purity in authenticity that cannot be replicated. And when you are people-pleasing, you are, it's like, it's manipulative. We might not see it that way. We might see it as being nice. We might see it as showing up for others. But if you find yourself feeling resentful, if you find yourself feeling used, if you find that you are overworking and overdoing, ask yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Am I doing this out of the kindness of my heart, or am I really doing this because I want something from this person, because I want to feel accepted, because I want to feel loved? If you want those things for yourself, give it to yourself first. And when you give it to yourself first, when you are kind, when you are generous, when you are loving, and when you are supportive, it comes from a pure place not from a place of manipulation. And this is, it's a hard word because it's like you're not doing anything wrong. 
but it's not a matter of right or wrong, but it's a matter of motives. What are your motives for doing what you do? And examining your motives for doing what you do is going to help you to understand if you're doing it because you need something or you're doing it because you actually love this person and you want to be supportive and you want to be there for them. 32. Showing up well means being well. And I was talking to a friend about this this morning. Um, We talk about showing up well from a place of performance, right? You showed up as a 10 out of 10. You, You did a good job. It was a good performance. But were you okay? Right? So when I talk about showing up well, I'm talking about your well being not your performance because yes, there are those those days when we're going to have to push through, right? Yes, there are those days when we are not at 100% physically, mentally, emotionally, but we still have to show up. You still have to do that presentation at work. You still have to show up for your child. You still have to show up for your spouse. You still have to do the things. You still have to do the chores around the house, X, Y, Z. But don't neglect yourself. Don't neglect your well-being for the sake of showing up well and being a 10 out of 10 at the, at the job, but not being a 10 out of 10 within. And there are some days you're going to be a 10 out of 10. Some days you're going to be a 2 out of 10. Some days you're going to be a 3 out of 10 in terms of your well-being. But as long as you have attended to yourself as long as you have checked in with yourself, right? We're not leaving the woman within behind while we're walking through life. As long as you have checked in with yourself, you've had that appointment with yourself, you've had that appointment with God, then you are showing up well. Because you might might be a two today, but you'll be a six tomorrow. Because when you're a two and you attend to yourself as a two, and you pay attention to yourself and you examine yourself and you deal with yourself and you take five minutes to journal and you say, this is how I feel. And this is what I think. And I think this is why, and maybe I'll try this tomorrow, right? That's showing up well. So I really want to encourage you, do not leave yourself behind in all the things that you have to do. Do not leave yourself behind. 33, you deserve the best. You deserve the absolute best. God in his wisdom created you. He has a plan for you. And that plan includes his best. Like God doesn't do things halfway. So he's not going to create you and create a plan for you that's so-so. Like his plans for you are the best possible plan that could ever be like the best relationship, the best job, the best house, the best finances, the best health situation, the best everything. Expect that. Walk in knowing that your creator deserves the best of you and wants the best for you. And you're going to show up differently when you have that realization. He gave his best. I can't do this without preaching. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would have everlasting life. What is better than living forever? Your spirit is going to live forever. And God saw to it that he would take care of your spirit forever. He gave his best because you deserve the best. So in this earthly life, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, your relationship, your job, your health, your finances, your everything, know that you deserve the best, the absolute best. 34, you are not stuck. You are not stuck. Get strategic. 
we will either complain or we will create. When you reach that point of frustration, those are the two options. You're going to sit and you're going to talk about what's wrong. And you might sit with that for a little bit. Okay, we've determined what's wrong. Now, what are we going to do? And a solution has to be created. And a scripture that stood out to me some time ago when I <laughs> I was stuck. We're talking about being stuck, but I felt like I was stuck in Genesis. And it was the creation of Eve where God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So God found a situation. He didn't complain. He created. And I believe that's what we're supposed to do. We were created as a solution. Woman was created as an attractive solution to the world. She was created out of man, not just for man, but for mankind. You are an attractive solution to the world. So whenever you see a problem, don't complain, create. See the problem for what it is, assess it, and create a solution. Watch things change when you continue with that mindset. 35, make room for more. I am actually in a process. There's a bag over there that has a bunch of clothes that I am going to donate. Over the last week, I have been giving away clothes little by little to people that I know, people that I know personally, and then some of my children's clothes and stuff like that. I'm going to drop off at Salvation Army or I'm going to give it to the church as donation but that's like a practical example. But in terms of what's going on within, that's not always so obvious. There are mindsets that you are holding on to. There is pain that you are holding on to. There is disappointment that you are holding on to. Think of the woman within as a vessel with a certain capacity. So if the space within you is full of those things, if the space within you is full of regret, it's full of hurt, it's full of disappointment, where's the blessing supposed to fit? Where's the hope supposed to fit? Where's the faith supposed to fit? Right? You have to make room for more. And if you think that there is more to life than this, like, have you heard yourself saying that there has to be more to life than this? There has to be more to life than what I'm experiencing. Then you have to make room. Because that means that there's a part of you that believes that that's possible. But if you're not making space, then what's the point? What's the point of hoping? What's the point of believing? What's the point of having faith for something to come into your life only to find when it comes into your life that you don't have space for it. That's like, you know, you have old furniture and it's, and it's worn and it's tattered. And you're like, I really need to replace this furniture. Like this, this sofa is falling apart. It can't even be fixed. It's beyond repair. Get rid of it. And this is, I believe, what we are afraid of. Because sometimes when we make room, when we get rid of the old thing and we make room for the new thing, we're left with this space and it looks like emptiness, but it's not emptiness. It's potential. And sometimes we have been so so familiar with what's dysfunctional, we'd rather be dysfunctional than be empty. But rewire your thinking around what emptiness is. Because emptiness is opportunity. 
So when you decide to throw out the old thing that no longer serves you, you now have space to welcome the new thing that does. And that's not always a physical thing. It's not always a person because sometimes we are very quick to get rid of things and to get rid of people when we actually need to get rid of mindsets and we actually need to get rid of habits and we actually need to get rid of routines that no longer serve us. So when I talk about making room for more, it's not just making room physically. It's not just making room in your, in your social circle, but it's also making room within yourself, making room in your spirit and in your mind and making room on your schedule. What are you doing with your life? How is your day constructed? What do you want to welcome into your life that you don't have time for? And I, I always encourage women to take an audit of their time. How much time are you spending on social media? I know this video is long, but this is for your benefit. <laughs> How much time are you spending on social media? Scrolling. I'm talking about mindless scrolling. I'm not talking about the podcasts that you're listening to that are actually edifying you and educating you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the mindless scrolling and the cat videos and the, um, the politics and the celebrities and the gossip and the, the makeup routines and the stuff that's actually not really enriching your life. How much time are you spending doing that? And then you say, oh, I don't have time to work out. I don't have time to go to school. I don't have time to spend with the people who want to spend time with me, but you're busy scrolling on social media or you're going to brunch every weekend, sometimes twice a week. And then you're saying, um, well, I can't really budget and I don't really know where my money is going. Are you making room for what you want? Are you making room in your routine? Are you making room in yourself? Are you making room in your social circle? Are you making room in your life? Are you making room in your environment, in your physical space for what you want? Make room for more. You're getting your hopes up. You're hoping again. You're dreaming again. You have faith again. Make room for the blessing. Make room for the vision. The vision is going to need somewhere to reside. The vision is going to take up space. So you need to expand and you need to create space in your environment. We're almost done. Number 36, you are responsible for your own reactions. Have you ever hastily responded in a certain way and regretted it immediately? This could be not necessarily in anger. This could be a reaction that could be taken the wrong way by another person. It's, it could be a reaction that, let's say someone um, tells you something, they reveal something to you, they're very vulnerable with you, and then you respond in a kind of judgmental way. You respond with your first authentic reaction, not because you're being insensitive, but because you are being hasty. Wisdom is going to tell you to pause and to be gentle in your response. And this doesn't mean that you're not going to be honest, but it means that now the response is going to take into account how that person's going to feel. And there are ways that we can communicate and we can say things to people that will get the point across without hurting the relationship. And this is a skill that takes time because how many times have you responded off the cuff and you've actually caused more problems than the thing that you're discussing, right? So 
Proverbs. In Proverbs, it talks about the woman of noble character, and it talks about how faithful instruction is on her tongue, and she speaks with wisdom. She opens her mouth with wisdom. So responding to people, taking account, taking their feelings into account, taking your own authenticity into account is so important. I'm looking at my notes, sorry. Your reactions are not always automatic. And this is coming to me in real time. I didn't even write this. Sometimes we react because we weren't listening. And someone else is talking. And this can happen like in a heated argument. Like you're just waiting for them to stop talking so you could say what it is that you have to say. Listen, listen, and you'll find that if you adopt this mentality of prioritizing those three daily appointments with God, with yourself and with others in that order, you're going to find that you're listening better. You're going to find that you are more compassionate And you're going to find that you are more careful with your responses and your reactions to people because you are responsible for your reactions. You might say, oh, I said that because I was angry. I said that because I was upset. You hurt my feelings. All that is valid. But life and death are in the power of the tongue. And they are, there are repercussions for every word that you speak and we have to be careful of what we're saying because our role as women is so vital in so many relationships in business in family in marriage so vital So we cannot be careless with our words. Number 37, when it comes to the things that you say you want, those New Year's resolutions, those goals that you made on your birthday, when it comes to those things, ask yourself, is this a goal or is it a fantasy? Because if it is a goal, a goal, (laughs) you are going to need a strategy. There is no strategy for a fantasy. A fantasy is a daydream. You stare off into space and you smile at yourself and you just hope one day this thing is just going to fall into your lap. That's a fantasy. But a goal requires you to be intentional. It requires you to be consistent. It it requires you to be accountable. It requires you to show up. And I'm not saying to throw your fantasies away because when we talk about making room for more, the fantasy falls into that category. Leave some white space on your vision board for God to just fill in, for God to just blow your socks off, to blow your mind. Leave some space there. Don't have your schedule so full and so rigid that you don't have time to enjoy life and you don't have room for surprises. So it's not that the fantasy doesn't have its place. It's not that the desire doesn't have its place, but we absolutely need goals. We need goals to work towards. We need goals to keep us on track. We need goals to keep order in our lives. So it's just a matter of prioritizing what is a goal and what is a fantasy. Number 38, be the game changer. You have been playing the game of life by other people's rules for a long time. You can be the game changer and not just change the rules of the game, but to play a different game altogether. It may be for some of you that you need to stop playing other people's games. 
Just leave the game alone. Walk away. Say, I'm not playing this anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not doing it this way anymore. This isn't working. Not for the sake of being defiant, but for the sake of stewarding your own soul. There are situations, situationships, jobs, all types of circumstances that we have gotten ourselves into that we need to walk away from or that we need to change how we interact with. Do not be afraid to be the game changer. And if you are, this is going to tie into the next to the next one. So I'm just going to go into 39. 39 talks about peacekeeping versus peacemaking. If you are a peacekeeper, you will slip things under the rug and slip things under the rug and slip things under the rug. And you will continue to play the game and you will continue to smile and you will continue to pretend that everything is okay when it's not. And you are not supposed to be a peacekeeper. You're supposed to be a peacemaker. And sometimes peacemaking requires you to fight back. Peacemaking requires you to speak up. Peacemaking requires you to change the game. Because what happens when you keep sweeping things under the rug, that stuff piles up under the rug. And one of these days, you're going to walk by and you're going to fall flat on your face because you tripped on all the stuff that you swept under the rug. So when it comes to peace, we don't aim to keep the peace. We aim to make peace. And when you make peace, that takes effort. It takes patience. It takes an intentionality. But when you make peace, the peace is perfect. And the peace is permanent. So be a peacemaker, not a peacekeeper. At number 40, we made it to the end. And if you made it to the end, I want you to comment what number 40 is. And that is shine. Shine. Wherever you are, shine. Step out from the shadows. You don't have to be in the spotlight. The thing is about shining, the size of the light does not matter. Don't compare your light to another woman's light. One woman might be a glow. One woman might be a strobe light. One woman might be fireworks. One woman might be a candle. One woman might be a match. Whatever size your light is, shine. Don't hide. No more shyness. No more doubt. No more fear. No more indecision, no more shuffling your feet. Step out and shine. So, these 40 lessons, 40 lessons from my 40s. If you have made it to the end, if you have received any value from this, like this video, share this video with as many women as possible who you believe can benefit from hearing a message like this. Other women in their 40s, women in their 20s, teenagers. This applies to so many women, but these specifically are lessons that I learned in my 40s. And they're lessons that I hold dear they are lessons that I treasure. They are lessons that I am grateful for. And if you are a woman over 40 or over 60 or over 50 or 82 or whatever age you are, and there is a lesson that you have learned in life, I would love if you would share it in the comments below so other women can benefit from your wisdom. Thank you for listening. This is your birthday gift to me for listening and hearing me out on this. And I really hope this helps. Blessings on your journey. And I will talk to you very soon. Bye.